is great fun being able to reach out and share information that makes your financial life better. And I'm going to, in just a second, I am going to introduce Christine Benz. And boy, is she going to do a lot to, 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 to do that here this evening. But very quickly, I just want to tell people, next week on the 15th, we have another presentation. I will be doing the presentation, and it's basically for first-time investors, although I think anybody will learn from it. I want to make sure that young investors and other first-time investors take all the right steps to get the most out of their investments. And so I'll be talking about my new book, we're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. And everybody will be able to get a free copy of a, the PDF of the book who come and, and, and join us. And then the week after that, uh, a, a really, a, another, like Christine is knows so much, Larry Swedro knows so much too. And these two people have such a rich background in the investment process. And you, you will love the, the, the information that Larry has to share with us. As a matter of fact, I happen to know some ways that Christine and Larry differ on things. So I'll, I'll be putting together what I hear from Christine tonight and Larry then, and we'll have some fun with that. Not gonna embarrass anybody. And then a week after that, we're going to have one of the true all-stars in the educational process dealing with financial literacy. I don't know anybody else like Tim Ranzetta. Tim Ranzetta started an organization, nextgenerationpersonalfinance.org. If you want to go to the website, ngpf.org. And if you're going to come join us, or even if you're not, I hope you'll take the time to go on the internet and take a look at his video, The Most Important Class You Never Had but he is changing the lives of young people like nobody else that I know. And he's going to come join us. So now let's get down to business because we got some great information tonight. Christine Benz is somebody who I have, I've known, but, but really I followed because she puts out some of the best information uh, and one of the reasons that she puts out such great information is because she has at her so resort as a resource, Morningstar, she was, I, we talked before we got started, they now have some 6,000 people. She was around 200 or so. So she has been at Morningstar since the early days, which gave her a chance to be involved in many different levels uh, there as an analyst, as an editor, but for, I think, 12 years now, she has been the director of personal finance. She has a weekly uh, podcast, The Long View. Uh, she is absolutely committed. In fact, I'm going to post a piece she wrote about her journey to becoming a part of the Morning Star mission. And uh, I think if you have young people who like to hear about success stories of folks who work their way up uh, through the, the corporation, particularly one of those hard charging, growing, high, high growth organizations, it really is. It's a touching story. And, uh, and I am so pleased to be able to introduce you to one of Barron's 100 top women financial experts. And, and really, I think, oh, by the way, I should mention, there's something I know you're looking for because you ask for it all the time. You want model portfolios. You want to know how to invest depending on how much risk you're willing to take and, and what funds you might have access to, et cetera. She has, Christine has over 20 model portfolios. Christine Benz, thank you so much for coming to help us this evening. Well, Paul, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. It's uh, really lovely to be here. I have to say that uh, the Washington state area is one of my play favorite places in the world. My husband and I have had many good vacations 
in that vicinity and, and would love to be there in person. But in the meantime, I'm happy to join you from my home office in the suburbs of Chicago. And I'm going to be talking tonight about retirement planning, which is an issue that I focus an awful lot on in my work at Morningstar. Um, before I get started, I just quickly wanted to discuss, um, and I, discuss sounds more in depth than I'll go. I just wanted to say that Morningstar.com has a lot of great information, much of it free. We do have a uh, paid service on the website that entitles uh, subscribers to read all of the analyst reports about individual stocks and mutual funds and exchange traded funds. But I wanted to mention that many libraries are subscribers to a version of that. So if your public library is a subscriber, you can access that same general set of research for free from your home desktop. Um, so check that out, ask your library because it's a pretty neat service and you would not need to pay anything directly. You're, you're paying indirectly through your library. So I wanted to mention that, but much of what's on Morningstar.com is free, including my model portfolios, including my articles. And my materials are really educational in nature. That's very much my focus at Morningstar. Um, so I'm going to be talking about retirement blind spots tonight. I'm going to share my screen with you here and we will um, get started on my presentation. And I'll just give you a quick overview of what I'll cover um, today. I'm going to start by talking about why I care so much about talking about retirement planning and specifically the retirement decumulation period. And then I'll get into the six blind spots. I'll talk about why these are risk factors for so many retirees, but I'll also talk about how you can address them at the portfolio level, as well as at the financial planning level. And then I'll talk about, um, or we'll tackle some questions toward the end of my presentation. So the reasons why I'm so passionate about this area of demystifying retirement decumulation. Well, at the top of the list is what I call the financial complexity complex, that we have a lot of agents, a lot of people in the financial services industry who unfortunately I think have sort of a mission to complexify investment planning and retirement planning. They want to make it seem so complicated that it's something, to, they want you to come away with the conclusion that you couldn't possibly tackle this on your own. And I do happen to think that retirement planning is a complicated area where many people could use an ad advisor's opinion in the context of their plans. But I also think that being empowered, getting knowledgeable about the basics of how to create a successful retirement plan is really incumbent upon each of us. So kind of combating the financial complexity complex is top of the list. Uh, I mentioned that retirement planning is, uh, retirement decumulation specifically, is more complicated than accumulating assets for retirement. Really accumulating assets for retirement, as long as you get started reasonably early, as long as you don't make big mistakes by dabbling in individual stocks, if you use some sort of semi-sane plan, it's not that difficult. But retirement decumulation, figuring out if you have enough, figuring out how to make sure that your portfolio is not unduly affected by inflation, making sure that your portfolio is able to last over a 25 to 30 year time horizon, that gets more complicated. So there's more to discuss in the realm of retirement decumulation. Another reason I like to work on this area is that there are a lot of behavioral issues wrapped up in retirement planning. So a common issue that retirees often run into is that they want to try to subsist on income alone. They want to try to subsist on whatever yield their portfolio produces. Well, as you all know, we've seen a period of dramatically declining yields where that's really difficult today, but that's a common behavioral issue. And there are many other behavioral issues. And, and frankly, they're just interesting to me as someone who works in this area, trying to help people make smart decisions about their retirement plans. One other reason I like to work on retirement decumulation and educating about it 
is that people at this life stage, as they get close to retirement, are extremely receptive to getting information about how to do it. I have sometimes um, been involved in financial education with younger investors, even high school students, where you get sometimes people who are kind of disengaged from the process because they don't have any funds to invest. It's not really relevant to them at, the, at their particular life stage. Or retirees, pre-retirees really need to figure this stuff out. So I find that they're incredibly receptive to learning. And finally, um, on a personal note, I would say that I, I was a partner to my parents as they embarked on their retirement years. And my dad had been kind of an investment mentor to me as I was starting out in my career. And I was always sort of his investment buddy side by side with him. And my dad experienced cognitive decline later in his life. And I was so glad that I was there with him to be his investment investment partner and to really manage my parents' finances in their later years before they passed away. I often speak to groups of retirees where perhaps there's not that trusted financial partner. And so um, part of my mission is just to try to do education, try to make sure that the people I'm talking to are as empowered as they possibly can be. And if they do need to go out and find some sort of external help to, to help them through their financial plan in their retirement years, that I, I think they can be savvy about selecting their financial advisors. So those are just some of the reasons why I like to work in this, in this specific area of retirement decumulation. So getting into the blind spots of the presentation, the first uh, blind spot is relates to what we call retirement date risk. And what that means is that the date on which we, re we retire, and some of you may already be retired, but our specific retirement date isn't always 100% within our controls. It may be, but oftentimes there's some slippage. And what you can see on this slide is people who were surveyed prior to their retirement were asked when they expected to retire. And then they were later surveyed about when they actually did retire. And what you can see is that there's a disconnect. You can see that many more people expected to delay retirement than actually did delay retirement. So about 60% of people between the ages of 50 and 64 retired, many fewer thought they would be retiring during that early window. So the takeaway here is that we oftentimes don't have control over our specific retirement date. Um, and there are lots of reasons for why that happens. There may be reasons why people are forced out of their jobs earlier than they might have anticipated. This pandemic has been just such an environment where we've seen older adults being displaced from the workforce more than the general workforce, more than the general population. That stands in contrast to the last financial crisis where we saw older adults being able to hang on to their jobs better than younger adults, the pandemic has forced more older adults out of work earlier than they, than they might have expected. So unexpected job loss. We know ageism is a thing in our culture. Um, in some cases, people might have jobs that entail some level of physical exertion that they're unable to do in their later years, there may simply be health issues, either the worker's own health issues, spouse's health issues, parental health issues. I was someone who was involved in helping care for my parents in their later years, not directly, but helping oversee caregivers. And I know personally that that can take a toll. And thankfully, I work for an employer that was incredibly generous in terms of letting me balance my family responsibilities with my work responsibilities, but we know that many other employers are not uh, quite as generous. So a lot of these issues can conspire against people continuing to work as long as they might hope to. So I'm always a little troubled when I'm out talking to older adults who tell me that their plan is to continue working as, you know, working as late as like age 75 or something like that. 
we know that forces beyond our control can sometimes cause us to, to need to leave the workforce earlier than we might like. So why is this a problem from a financial standpoint? Well, it probably seems pretty obvious that if you are forced to retire earlier than you anticipated, you can't continue to make contributions to your retirement plans. You may um, have fewer, fewer years that your portfolio can continue to comp compound and enjoy returns prior to needing to draw upon it. And another thing that I would point out is that much of the research we have about what is a sustainable withdrawal rate for retirement relates to like a 25 or 30 year drawdown period. Anytime you're looking at longer periods than sort of the standard 25 to 30 year period, well, you need to be that much more conservative about withdrawal rates. So some of you may know people in the financial independence or retire early movement, the FIRE movement, um, I sometimes hear those folks talk about like a 4% withdrawal rule for their retirements. And that makes me really nervous because we really just don't have retirement withdrawal strategies stress tested over such a long period. Um, and finally, if someone is forced to retire earlier than they expected, they may not be able to do other beneficial strategies like delaying Social Security, which in turn can force them to take more from their portfolios early on um, in their retirement. And that may, in fact, impair their portfolio's long-term sustainability. So how do we mitigate this risk, this retirement date risk, if we're still working? Well, an obvious one is to continue to nurture our human capital throughout our careers, even into our 50s, even into our 60s, making sure that we're staying current on technology. And I think the certainly the, the past year has given us all a crash course in um, get, getting up to speed on technology, but just making sure that we're continuing to burnish our human capital, attending seminars, attending continuing continuing education, whether it's required or not. I think it's also worthwhile for all of us as we move into our 50s and 60s to think about what our backup career might be if in case we were dislodged from our current career. So to think about your backup plan and then maybe your backup plan to the backup plan. Um, it's just worth thinking through what you would do if you were unable to continue in your current occupation. And I think what's, what people sometimes don't realize is that even if you aren't able to, to stick with a career that's as remunerative as the one that you had during your main earning years, even if you can continue to pay the bills with some other career and forestall portfolio withdrawals, kind of those hybrid strategies can be incredibly impactful as well. And there's been some great research done in this area of what are called encore careers, where perhaps you're pursuing something that isn't as high earning as your main career, but perhaps it's more gratifying. If that can keep you in the workforce, if that can keep you earning a paycheck that in turn can help you pay your bills, those hybrid strategies can be great, great strategies as well. Saving more while you're working, obviously, to help mitigate the impact of early retirement is kind of a, a, an obvious conclusion to come away with. And finally, giving a little bit of thought to insurance planning, specifically health care planning. So for all of us in our 50s and 60s, I think it's worth thinking through if your health care is coming through your employer, what is your backup plan in case you were unable to be under that employer's health care plan? So perhaps it's the um, it, it's COBRA, perhaps it's the ACA, but just thinking through and perhaps even taking the next step of pricing what that health care coverage might look like for you is, is a good step just so that you're prepared for health care coverage prior to Medicare coverage. So the next uh, blind spot that I wanted to cover is what's called sequencing 
risk. And I'll explain what we're looking at on this slide. This is uh, two different retirement start dates. One would be the mother of all bad start dates for a retirement. This would be in the early 70s, early 1970s period. If you embarked upon retirement then, retirement research real, researchers really agree that that is the worst period into which you might have retired because you had a bear market in equities and some of you may have been investing during that period of the early 70s. You had a runaway inflation after that. You had a lot of risk factors for retirees. So what we're looking at is if someone embarked on retirement during that terrible period and had a portfolio that was 50% stocks and 50% bonds, during that period, a $500,000 portfolio, if they were spending 5% of that portfolio, they would have burned through that portfolio in a 20-year period. And those of us who focus on retirement research see that as a failure because you want your retirement portfolio to last longer than that. Unless you wait until age 75 or something to retire, you want to plan for more like a 25 or 30 year retirement, potentially even longer. So such a, such a withdrawal strategy, that 5% withdrawal rate, that 50-50 portfolio would have been out of funds in 20 years. If we reversed that sequence of returns, so if the great returns of the early 90s occurred at the beginning of the period, which is what we're looking at on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that it's an entirely different situation. So same 50-50 portfolio, same 5% withdrawal rate, same initial $500,000. Well, not only did that person support his or her lifestyle in retirement, but also nicely grew the portfolio. And what this slide is meant to illustrate is that it's really luck of the draw. We don't quite know the specific environment that we'll retire into. And that is why we want to think about planning for the worst case scenario. So hoping for the best and planning for the worst. And my next slide illustrates how the right withdrawal rate really does depend on the specific time period into which you retire. So I've circled on the slide that really difficult period that we were looking at, that it really didn't matter what asset allocation, what stock bond mix you came into retirement with, you would have had a troubling retirement period and that's where um, when Bill Bengen, the financial planner who came up with the 4% guideline for withdrawal rates, he really focused on that specific area. And his conclusion was, even if you happen to retire into the worst market environment that, that we've seen so far in market history, if you took 4% of your portfolio initially and then inflation adjusted that dollar amount each year thereafter. So you're kind of looking for a stable, real stream of income in retirement. What Bill Bengen's research showed is that that strategy gave you a good shot at not outliving your assets. So that's why oftentimes you still hear the 4% guideline referenced in the context of withdrawal rate strategies, that perhaps that's a safe withdrawal rate strategy, even if the next 20 or 30 years aren't so great, or that maybe the next 10 years. So I've kind of mentioned why sequencing risk, why the sequence of returns that we experience in our retirement matters so much, that ideally you would be accumulating assets when they're cheap and selling them off throughout your retirement. So, you, so that's, if you're spending from your portfolio, you're essentially selling off pieces of your portfolio. That's the ideal sequence of return that you would experience prior to retirement. You'd buy stuff cheaply and then you'd sell it when it's more expensively. A negative sequence of return is when you kind of experience the opposite, where you are enjoying really great returns in your accumulation years, then you're having to sell them off potentially when things are headed down. 
So uh, encountering a negative return sequence can affect one or two things. Either the retiree really has to reduce his or her standard of, of living uh, when he or she encounters that poor market environment, or you do nothing, you just continue spending away blithely as we showed on that slide of the person taking 5% out of their portfolio and then you run out prematurely. So what do we do to mitigate this sequence of return risk, which as I said, is something that's kind of out of our control. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about that, but first I wanna just discuss the current market environment a little bit. This is a metric that's called Schiller PE, which is developed by a Yale economist named Robert Schiller. And it is a, a cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio. It's meant to be a, a measure of whether the market is cheap or expensive based on the cyclical factors, based on various market environments. And so one thing, if we look at Schiller PE, we see that it's been, been flashing a little bit of a warning signal for a while now where stocks have looked expensive based on this measure. A lot of um, people who look at this think that maybe it's a little bit overly cautionary because we have had great returns for the past couple of years. And you can see that Schiller PE has been elevated relative to uh, where it's been in history for the past several years, and yet the market has continued to go up. Um, this is a, a view of uh, asset class return forecasts from our team at Morningstar Investment Management. You can see that they too are predicting fairly meager returns from the US equity market over the next decade. And usually when you hear predictions, I would say run the other way, especially if they're short-term predictions. But all of us, when we're, we're creating a financial plan, we need to have some sort of baseline assumptions about how much the market is going to help us out. So our Morningstar investment management team and a lot of other firms do this sort of work as well. They come up with these forward-looking forecasts of what they expect different asset classes to return. So you can see those strongly positive sort of aqua bars there are their expectations for international developed and emerging markets stocks. They're expecting better returns there, but pretty muted returns from the US equity market. And they arrive at these forecasts by looking at starting dividend, current dividend yields, looking at their expectation of uh, earnings growth, what, what we expect to see from earnings growth in these various markets, and also looking at their expectation of valuation expansion or contraction over the next decade. So pretty muted returns from US stocks, pretty muted returns from bonds as well over the next decade. And the green bars, I should just say, that's the change um, from the previous quarter. So um, it, this is measuring the change between the end uh, in the fourth quarter of 2020. So the fourth quarter of 2020, if those of you who are investing through, the, through that period, you know it was a great market environment, which is why they ratcheted down their return expectations during that period. We're not alone in terms of um, being somewhat pessimistic about what the US market is likely to return over the next decade. Research Affiliates, which is uh, another firm that does these sorts of forecasts, and they have a neat interactive tool that you can uh, play around with. They too are sort of in that um, very low return expectation camp. Um, BlackRock is a little bit more positive. I would say Van Vanguard is somewhere in the middle. Um, but nonetheless, these return expectations are generally below the eight to 10% equity return that the market has delivered historically. And that's because we have had a pretty good run in the equity market already. If you've been investing in stocks through the past decade, you've enjoyed really nice growth. These numbers suggest that you probably wanna rein in your expectations a little bit for the next decade at least. Beyond that, it may be off to the races again, um, but near term, I think you probably would wanna think about having fairly muted return expectations for uh, US stocks, certainly maybe a little better return expectations for non-US stocks in part because valuations are relatively better.
So how do we mitigate this sequence of return risk? If we're getting ready to retire and we wanna make sure that we're not walking headlong into a really difficult market environment, well, there are a couple of ways to think about it. One would be to plan to reduce your portfolio withdrawals if you happen to encounter a really difficult market environment at the outset of, of your retirement. Make sure that you can potentially live on less if you need to, because all of the work that has been done on withdrawal strategies over the past couple of decades very much points to the power of if you can take less, if the market serves up very lousy results in your early years of retirement, if you can withdraw less in those years, if you can live on less, that really improves your portfolio sustainability. And the simple reason is the less you can spend when your portfolio is down, that leaves more of your portfolio in place to rebound and recover when the market eventually does. So there are lots of different variations on these strategies that uh, incorporate market returns, incorporate portfolio returns. I've cited a, a couple. Um, Vanguard has done some research in this realm. A financial planner, Jonathan Guyton, has done a fair amount of research in this realm. If you're interested, you can check out their uh, white papers on this topic. And then another thing to think about, so you're thinking about how much you're withdrawing from your portfolio if it does encounter a weak market environment early on. So you're thinking about your withdrawal rate, but then you're also thinking about the setup of your portfolio. And this is something that I've focused a lot on in my work on Morningstar.com, illustrating what I think sane portfolios are for retirement. So um, we'll just take a quick look. I've latched onto this, what's often called the bucket approach to retirement decumulation, just because I think it's a really intuitive way to approach a structure for a retirement portfolio that I think nicely addresses the idea of encountering a, a weak market environment early on. So the basic idea is that you are, with bucket one and bucket two, you're setting aside 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals in safer assets. So in bucket one, we've got maybe two, one to two years worth of portfolio withdrawals in just cash investments. We're settling for very low returns, potentially even slightly negative returns once inflation is factored in, we're settling for really low returns, but basically we're just battening down the hatches with that portion of our portfolio. We don't wanna risk anything because we don't wanna jeopardize our living, our, our lifestyle in those early years of retirement. And then with bucket two, we're stepping out a little bit on the risk spectrum. So we're still focusing on safer, investments, but we're including some short-term bonds, some intermediate-term bonds, a little bit of inflation protection. So I would include some treasury inflation protected securities there. But essentially I'm building a bulwark of 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals in safer assets so that if Armageddon occurs in the stock market at the outset of my retirement, I would have 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals to spend through before I would ever need to touch my stock portfolio. So how did I arrive at 10 years worth of portfolio withdrawals? Well, one thing I often think about is what is the probability of having a negative return from stocks? Well, if you have a 10 year time horizon, stocks are actually extraordinarily reliable. When we look at rolling periods throughout market history, if your holding period is at least 10 years, you've been positive like 90% of the time. But once you begin to shrink that time horizon, if you get into five years or God forbid, even fewer than that, well, stocks are just way too unreliable. The probability of having a negative return over those shorter time horizons is just too great. And so that's why I have latched on to this idea of 10 years. But I think if your portfolio plan is tighter, you could think about having more like seven years worth of portfolio withdrawals. But the basic idea is that you are building yourself a bulwark that you could spend through. 
which is not to say you would always spend through your portfolio in exactly this fashion, but you're setting yourself up to, in case your early retirement years feature a bad equity market, you've given yourself some safe assets at the front end. There are environments like right now, if you've been retired for, for, for a while, I would say leave your safer assets in place, don't spend through them, spend your appreciated equity assets. But if you are embarking on retirement and you happen to encounter a weak market, that's what this bucket stru structure is, is there for. And so this is just a sample portfolio that um, is segmented by these three buckets. This is an exchange traded fund portfolio. So it is focused on very low cost funds. Um, and you wouldn't need to follow this specific framework. My guess is that if you have a well diversified portfolio that includes some stocks, both US and international and includes some bonds and maybe a little bit of cash, you're probably already pretty close to having some version of a bucket strategy, but this is really just here for illustration purposes. So we're assuming um, in this case, a, a couple with a million and a half dollar portfolio with a desire to spend $60,000 from that portfolio in year one of retirement. So they're using kind of a 4% guideline for their spending. So they're spending 60,000 just 4% of that 1.5 million. And then you can see I've just kind of structured the buckets along the lines of what we've already been looking at. This is a radically simpler version of this. I'm always looking for ways to simplify the number of moving parts in retiree portfolios. While the previous slide features some assets that I do like to include in retiree portfolios, like short-term bonds, like treasury and in inflation protection, protected securities. Nonetheless, um, this is a radically simplified version that I think could do, um, I would say, a good 90% of what the more complicated portfolio does with, with fewer moving parts and very low expenses. So um, on to the next risk factor or blind spot. This is simply the very low yield environment that we find ourselves in today. This is probably something that many of you feel very acutely. Um, if you have tried to wring any sort of positive return out of your safe assets, you know this very well, that we have had to all settle for less and less and less on those interest bear bearing accounts in the name of safety over the past several decades. And really, truly, this has been going on since the 80s, where we've seen yields decline and decline and decline. And so that creates challenges for retirement planning. I mentioned at the outset that, um, you know, if you're like my father-in-law, where you very much were interested in subsisting on yield alone, and you didn't want to touch your principal, well, this has been challenging. You've had to take more risk in the name of generating a livable income stream from your portfolio. So um, I mentioned that many retirees do like the idea of living off yield alone, but um, when we do find ourselves in the kind of very low yield environment like we have today, that forces retirees to either subsist on less income, which of course <laughs> most of us do not wanna do that, or to take more risk in our investment portfolio in the interest of generating the yield that we need. Um, bond yields have historically been a pretty good predictor of what bond, bond returns might be over the next decade and we're at a very low ebb today. The 10 year treasury yield is 1.6%. If you want to earn a significantly higher return than that, you need to take more risk in your portfolio. And this is just a slide that illustrates that risk reward trade-off that comes along with venturing into higher yielding securities, um, especially within fixed income. There's a very neat relationship between higher yields and risk taking. In fact, um, we have a lot of fancy tools on Morningstar.com for drilling into what is the risk in a bond portfolio. So you can see lots of data on duration, which is a measure of interest rate sensitivity and a lot of fine detail on credit quality. I would say that if you're looking for a sense of whether a bond product is risky or not, just look at its yield. It's a very good 
predictor of whether a, a bond product is going to entail risk or not. So what we can see today is that yields, if you, know, if you wanted to try to, uh, ring, to ring a, a 4% yield from a portfolio, from a fixed income portfolio today, you're taking a lot of risk in that portfolio. And I've just provided on this slide, not saying that we are getting back to a 20, 2008 environment anytime soon, but just for a little bit of context, of what um, these investments returned during the last financial crisis. You can see that um, while their losses weren't as bad as the equity market, I think the S&P 500 returned, lost 37% in 2008. You can see that they were directionally similar, um, that with riskier fixed income products, you do get more sympathy with sympathy for what's going on in the economy and also more sympathy for what's going on in the equity market. Um, so how do we deal with the fact that yields are so low today and really are not conducive to subsisting on income during retirement, especially if we're just getting ready to retire? Well, how do we deal with this? And, and I would say that there are a couple of ways to think about it. One is to use some sort of a total return approach to decumulation. I would argue that it's all but a must for most retirees today, uh, where you are either using sort of a pure total return strategy, where perhaps even you're reinvesting your income distributions back into the portfolio and then periodically taking a look at that portfolio and seeing what should I sell to meet my living expenses. Um, if I were to talk to my colleagues in Morningstar Investment Management who do asset allocation and financial planning all day, every day, they would say that's how best to decumulate a portfolio because it gives you a chance to optimize your portfolio on an ongoing basis to take risk out of your portfolio while simultaneously supplying your living expenses. So if you can, at the end of each year, take a step back and look at the most appreciated portions of your portfolio, well, those are oftentimes the riskiest portions of your portfolio that you might wanna be trim trimming back anyway. Um, some retirees might say, well, I'm not really comfortable with that pure total return strategy. I like the idea of some kind of income from my portfolio. In that case, I think you can reasonably use kind of a hybrid strategy where you're not going out of your way to generate income from your portfolio, but you're simply building a sensible total return portfolio, which today will get you maybe a 2%, maybe slightly sub 2% yield. And then you are using rebalancing to make up the difference. I think that hybrid strategy can make a lot of sense as well, where you got kind of a baseline of your living expenses coming in through income and dividend distributions that are organically occurring from your portfolio. And then you're using rebalancing to make, to make up the difference. I think that strategy can work perfectly well as well. So um, this is just an example of how this would work it in practice. So let's assume that I have a 60% S&P 500, so 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio in 2017. Well, the organic yield from that portfolio was about $20,000. If my income needs were, were $40,000, if my cash flow needs were $40,000, well, then I would be able to turn to my appreciated equity assets to supply the additional living expenses. So 2017 was an extraordinarily strong year for the market. I would have had my additional um, $18,500 in living expenses from rebalancing, and then I'd be able to uh, reinvest back into the portfolio or perhaps set up my cash flows for the next couple of years by pulling money from the appreciated equity assets. Some years are not as good as 2017, even though 2017 was good, 2019 was good, 2020 was good, 2018 was not so good. And that's one reason why I like that idea of having cash reserves set aside or at least having some money in safer assets that you could pull from in those weak years. So um, 
bond yields were pretty low in, in 2018 and the equity market wasn't so great. So you would be able to potentially pull from cash assets to leave your fixed income assets and certainly leave your equity assets alone in a year like that. I want to touch on another risk factor for retirement. This is something I've been thinking a lot about recently, which is inflation. And we have had a lot of uh, drum beating about the prospect of higher inflation. I would say there was also a similar set of concerns coming out of the last financial crisis, a lot of hand wringing over the amount of government stimulus, that this was sure to lead to inflation. And lo and behold, we went, went on to have a decade's worth of very benign inflation from 2010 through uh, through 2020, really, we had a period of extremely low inflation. We're hearing concerns about inflation again. I, I personally am experiencing food inflation. I don't know about all of you at the grocery store. Definitely seeing that one come on strong. Um, and certainly people who are uh, in the housing market, who are purchasing homes, we're all seeing a lot of home price inflation going on. So, um, it's a concern, I think, and one that we need to be mindful of when we think of our retirement plans. We want to make sure that we are troubleshooting the prospect of higher inflation as part of our plans. So um, this slide illustrates what I think is a really interesting uh, look at how the consumer price index is calculated. And if you've ever looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics website, you can see that they provide a ton of useful data and they provide a decomposition of how they arrive at that consumer price index. And the main consumer price index you hear cited is the CPIU, it's called, the Consumer Price Index for All Urban Consumers. And it's meant to, me it's meant to measure how consumers at large are spending their money. So what are they spending their money on? And you can see that um, CPIU includes allocations to various goods and services that are meant to reflect what the population is lar at large is doing with their money. CPIE is another measure of inflation that is meant to measure how older adults are spending their money. And I think CPIE can be really useful when thinking about, well, how might my spending be different in retirement than it was perhaps during my working years, during my younger years? How might it vary a little bit? So you can see CPIE I've included here, just how it varies from CPIU in terms of the expenditures. Um, so one that might jump right out at you is the very high number assigned to housing and um, you might say, well, I own my own home, so inflation probably is not going to be that big a deal for me. And it may, in fact, not be a particularly big deal for your home. Uh, you won't have rent, obviously, um, but you may continue to experience inflation in other home-related items. So your utilities would experience inflation. If you're paying people to do home maintenance for you, if you're paying people to cut your grass or do other work around your house, you may experience inflation there. Um, so even if you are a homeowner, you chances are will experience some inflation, even though your mortgage is paid off. Um, another category I would call your attention to on this slide is um, the healthcare line. And you'll see that for medical expenses, older adults, not surprisingly, tend to spend more on medical care, on health care than the general population. Um, is, as it turns out, over this particular period that I've captured here, which is just the one year period through February, you can see that healthcare inflation is actually pretty much under control. In fact, it's been in sort of a, a good pattern since the Affordable Care Act passed, where we've seen some tamping down of healthcare inflation, which is a really great trend for retirees. But over longer periods, we have seen a negative trend where, as many of you know, healthcare inflation has been running much higher than the general inflation rate. 
I think it may in fact get back to a higher level, whether we're in a permanent, um, in a permanent lull for healthcare inflation, I think is an open question. I think retirees would be wise to plan for higher healthcare ex expenditures, which, which I'll touch on in a sec, as well as potentially higher inflation in retirement due to, um, due to, due to healthcare inflating. So um, how do we mitigate well, first, I'll, I'll touch on why this matters, why we need to concern ourselves with this. Um, one reason is that while we're working, while we're getting paychecks, we're usually getting some sort of cost of living adjustment in our paychecks. When we are retired, we may still be getting a, a cost of living adjustment in our Social Security paycheck where you get a modest uh, nudge up to account for inflation. If we're lucky enough to get in to have an inflation adjusted pension, all the better, but that's a dwindling group of us who will be retiring with an inflation adjusted pension. So the reason why we need to care about inflation for retirement is the portion of our portfolios that we're withdrawing to pay for stuff is not automatically adjusted for inflation. So those withdrawals that we were looking at on earlier slides where we were talking about withdrawal rates and we we're looking at portfolio structures, those amounts that we're pulling from our portfolios, those aren't inflation adjust, adjusted. And to the extent that we have safe assets in our portfolio, to the extent that we have cash, to the extent that we have nominal bonds, whether treasury bonds or corporate bonds that aren't inflation adjusted, well, that purchasing power from whatever interest we're able to earn on that environment, on, on those investments, is eaten away by inflation. So that's why when we come into retirement, we have more conservative assets in our portfolio, but that's why we need to be really concerned about inflation. So how do we mitigate this risk? Well, I, th I think you think about addressing it from a couple of standpoints. One is at the portfolio level. So making sure that you have inflation hedges in your portfolio. So you are protecting your purchasing power to the extent that you have safer assets that you're earmarking a portion of them for, I, I like the idea of including like 20% of the portfolio of the bond portfolio in what are called treasury inflation protected securities, which give your principal value a little bit of a nudge up to keep pace with inflation. So you think about inflation hedges like those. You might also think about having a healthy component of stocks because even though stocks are by no means a hedge against inflation, when we look at the categories that have historically been able to out earn inflation to have a higher rate of return than inflation, stocks have historically done that. So yes, they're volatile, but they have historically had a better return than the inflation rate. So we think about adding those categories first and foremost, and then we might think about adding a few other categories around the margins. One I would mention would be um, bank loan investments, sometimes called floating rate investments. This is a really interesting sort of junky bond category. So I'd want to relegate it to kind of the margins of my portfolio. But the nice thing about this category is that when yields go up, you get a little bit of an adjustment in your interest rate. Um, so it's a category to consider because when we look at categories that have historically had some ability to keep pace with inflation. The bank loan investments do that. High yield bonds, again, kind of a niche category that I would really limit my exposure to, but historically they have shown pretty well as a hedge against inflation. A lot of times people like to own real estate as a component of their retirement portfolios. I know Paul Merriman is a, a big believer in owning some real, real estate securities as a portion of a portfolio. One of the features of real estate investments, real estate investment trusts, is that um, historically the owners of REITs, the, the landlords that own these properties are able to push through um, increases in rents that you as an owner of a REIT are able to benefit from. 
So um, that is one reason why REITs are often considered a decent hedge against inflation. So that's kind of at the portfolio level. At the plan level, I think you can think about mitigating inflation risk in a couple of different ways. Delaying Social Security is one because you pick up an enhanced return on your uh, on, on your benefit, and that uh, delay also leads to a higher inflation adjusted benefit. And then also if you're looking at other products as part of your plan, whether annuities or long-term care insurance, adding some sort of inflation protect protection may make sense there. It may be overly costly, it may not be worth it, but it, it may be worth investigating. This um, slide is, I won't delve into the specifics of what we're looking at here, but my colleague David Blanchett at Morningstar has spent a lot of time researching how retirement spending changes throughout our retirement years. And if we had a live audience, I would ask you to kind of walk me through what we're looking at here, because chances are you've had some experience with this by knowing retirees in your life or by being a retiree yourself, you know that oftentimes the early years of retirement, the um, sort of say mid 60s to age 70 sort of period, those are the high spending fun years of retirement where sometimes there, there's pent up demand. Um, certainly coming out of the pandemic, there will be pent up demand to do travel and dining out and all the things that we all look forward to in retirement. Those are the higher spending sort of discretionary years. Then spending trails off later on in retirement before trending back up um, in, in the very late years of retirement. And many of you know well why those expenses trend up later on in retirement. That's typically big health care outlays later in life oftentimes unfunded long-term care expenses. So for people who don't have long-term care and insurance, they may need to fund some of those costs out of pocket. So David has uh, written extensively about this topic, about how it's not just a flat line of spending throughout our retirement trajectories. It's oftentimes kind of this smile pattern that he has detected in his research. Um, and so I want to delve into that healthcare cost risk. Um, Fidelity annually puts out these uh, estimates of what the typical 65 year old couple will spend on out of pocket healthcare costs in retirement. The most recent tally came in just, just around $300,000. And so this includes Medicare premiums, it includes supplemental insurance policies, which many of you I'm sure know, uh, can be one of the largest budget items for many retiree households. It includes pharmaceutical costs that are not covered by Medicare. So when we tally all those up, we um, Fidelity has, has come up with this $300,000 lifetime outlay. Importantly, Fidelity's estimate does not include long-term care costs. So those costs, as, as many of you know, can really stack up as well. I think it's always important to note, though, um, I think that $300,000 number is absolutely terrifying. But the fact is, for those of us who are employed and those health care premiums are just getting deducted from our paychecks, it's kind of invisible, but really we've been paying in many cases quite sizable amounts all along. We just really don't feel it because it comes out of our paycheck be before we even see it. So they're not brand new expenses, um, the, the baseline premium expenses. They've really been with us in, in some fashion all along. So how do we mitigate this risk? Well, I think it's uh, worth thinking about your own health care needs. Um, Vanguard has done some further research with, Mer with Mercer on this topic. And what Vanguard found is just a huge amount of variability in healthcare outlays based on geography. Certainly those of us who live in higher cost geographies can expect to pay more for care. Based on health, our overall health um, uh, conditions uh, tend to be quite predictive. Um, coming into retirement, if you've had very few healthcare outlays, 
you may be lucky and that may stay with, stay with you. So um, the state of our health coming into retirement tends to be pretty predictive about how much we'll spend. Um, and I think it's also important if you are an early retiree to be factoring in and pricing in uh, your pre-Medicare health care outlays, what those might look, look like and how those might drag on your plans, expenses in the early years of retirement before you're uh, Medicare eligible. I think it's also just worth looking at um, your insurance costs prior to retirement. Obviously, some of you, if you're already retired, you're already experiencing these costs. Um, and then I just wanted to make a shout out for those of you who are still in the accumulation years, and maybe you're many or several years away from retirement. There are some tax advantaged ways to save specifically for retirement health care costs um, or pre-retirement health care costs. And I would just give a shout out to using health savings accounts in this context. Anyone who does any sort of tax planning is usually pretty enthusiastic about health savings accounts. The tax features are unparalleled in the tax code. So if you're someone who is covered by what's called a high deductible health care plan, a qualifying high deductible health care plan, you're eligible to contribute to what's called a health savings account. And there are contribution limits annually uh, for HSAs and for 2021, it's um, in the neighborhood of like 7,000 if you're covered by a family, uh, family high deductible plan. But the benefits are that you're able to make pre-tax contributions, you're able to enjoy tax-free compounding as long as the money it stays inside the HSA. And then as long as you pull the money out for qualifying healthcare expenses, your withdrawals are also tax-free. So it's triple tax advantaged in contrast with say an IRA where you're either making after-tax contributions through a Roth and then enjoying tax-free withdrawals on the way out or if you're doing traditional IRA contributions, you are getting the tax break on the way in and then paying taxes on the way out. The HSA is tax advantaged at every step of the way. So it's a really nice vehicle to consider. And um, I sometimes get the question about whether you can oversave in an HSA. I would say not really, because worst case scenario, and you don't use any money um, in your HSA prior to retirement, and you have more um, in your HSA than you actually need for healthcare expenses. Well, worst case scenario, those non-healthcare related expenses in retirement, once you're past age 65, are treated just like traditional IRA uh, withdrawals. So they're taxed at your ordinary income tax rate, but you won't have any penalties on those withdrawals. So I'm an evangelist for HSAs. If you have one, think about using it because the tax benefits are, are pretty hard to beat. I want to touch just uh, quickly, and I know that we are um, coming up on time here, and I want to take some questions, but um, I want to touch quickly on long-term care risk. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. My parents had uh, long-term care costs late in life. I mentioned that my dad had dementia, and um, it was a big outlay. And thankfully, my parents had um, been good savers. They had uh, more than enough to get them through that period. But as the person who was writing the checks out of my parents' accounts for them, it was painful to see the outlays for long-term care. Um, this type of care, contrary to uh, popular confusion, is not covered by Medicare. Um, some level of care may be covered by Medicare if you have a qualifying hospital stay preceding needing rehab care, but mostly this care is not covered by uh, our healthcare system, not covered by Medicare currently. So it's incumbent upon all of us as we're thinking about our retirement plans to make a plan for long-term care. And for a big segment of our population, government provided long-term care will be the answer. Medicaid is the biggest payor of long-term care in the US. 
Um, so certainly for people who do not have large portfolios, that will be their long-term care plan. Um, but for those of you who have more sizable portfolios, I think you either want to think about insuring against long-term care risk, or at least if you are planning to self-fund long-term care, at least um, making sure that you are being thoughtful about how much you might need for long-term care, and then also segregating that fund from your uh, spendable assets. So sometimes I think about having like a fourth bucket. Uh, we talked about those three buckets, would, which would be sort of your spendable assets, but maybe a fourth bucket makes sense in this context where you have set aside money to cover any long-term care costs should you incur them or um, any uh, uh, maybe extra uh, longevity expenses if you turn out to be a person who lives to 110 or something like that. And then, you know, best case scenario and, and you leave money behind, then that's money that, that's there for your, um, for your heirs. The cost for long-term care um, vary dramatically based on geography. If you are living in a, in a large urban center, you will pay more for long-term care. This could be a whole separate topic unto itself. It's a crucial topic. Um, we have had certainly devastating effects from this pandemic for people in institutionalized long-term care. I think a lot of folks are really rethinking where, where they want to receive long-term care. My, my mom and dad had care in their home, which was very much their preference. Um, and I think it's a preference for many of us for obvious reasons. One thing I would say is that if that is your plan, just make sure that you have a, a younger loved one in your life who can keep that whole thing up and running for you because it really uh, does require a lot of commitment on the part of your children or grandchildren or other younger loved ones in your life to, to make that thing work for you. Um, so just uh, quickly cycling through the um, opportunities or the possibilities for covering long-term care, purchasing a, a policy, purchasing a pure long-term care policy may be an option. We've seen premiums really go through the roof though for some con consumers who thought they were doing all the right things by purchasing long-term care policies. They've gotten hit with these premium increases. Um, some insurers have just gotten out of the business altogether. Uh, which has not been great for consumers. Increasingly, we've seen some of these hybrid long-term care policies come on strong. And uh, the hybrid policies are policies that blend together typically a life insurance policy with a long-term care rider bolted onto it. So there's a nice level of optionality in that um, so that if you end up needing long-term care, it reduces your death benefit that you would leave behind. If you do not need the long-term care, the full death benefit would pass to your heirs. Um, there are also annuity long-term care hybrids where uh, if you need long-term care, you would be able to use it and it would reduce the amount of your payout from the annuity accordingly. So there are a lot of different variations. These products are more complicated. I would say if you're interested in a product like this, get help from a trusted disinterested observer who's not involved in selling these products. So sit down with a CFP who does not earn any sort of commission from these products, get a disinterested observer to help you navigate because they can be super complicated. Um, we mentioned the other options of self-funding or using government provided resources. I wanna just touch real briefly on longevity risk. It's often funny to me that this is even a risk because this is in so many ways a good news story that we're all living longer uh, and we're working fewer years but it creates challenges from a portfolio standpoint. Um, just a quick few stats about longevity risk. If you're a higher income person, and chances are if you're someone who's attuned to investing, probably are a higher income person. 
you have, uh, you're much more likely to live longer than the, the general population, unfortunately. Longevity is not equally distributed in our country and correlates very neatly with, with income, unfortunately. Um, so if you are a higher income person, you need to be thinking about longevity risk and certainly also want to think about your own health conditions and your own family history of longevity when deciding how much uh, care you want to put into protecting your portfolio against longevity risk. But longevity risk is a challenge for higher income folks, especially because more and more of us will be coming into retirement with just one source of income that is a lifetime source of income. So for me, uh, and many of my other, uh, many of my baby boomer and Gen X counterparts, we will be coming into retirement with just Social Security as our lifetime income source. We will not have pensions, and it's a dwindling share of the population that will be able to rely on pensions. So how do we mitigate this? Well, we are thoughtful and conservative about withdrawal rates. So if we think we'll li live 25 or 30 years or even longer in retirement, that means that we need to, to be taking less uh, from our portfolio. It also means that um, you know, if we are using the required minimum distribution tables to withdraw from our IRAs as we need to, uh, to do once we hit age uh, 72, that potentially we're reinvesting a portion of our RMDs back into our portfolio. And then I think this also really argues for holding a healthy component of our portfolios and stocks, because we can't afford to have uh, most of our portfolio and very safe, very low returning assets. We absolutely need the growth potential that comes along with stocks. Um, I am going to skip this because I do want to tackle some of your questions. This is just some thoughts on how to mitigate longevity risk at the plan level. Um, a few of these things you've certainly heard elsewhere, especially the exhortation to delay Social Security if you possibly can. I know a lot of people don't love that idea, but uh, if you are concerned about longevity risk, it can be incredibly impactful because it enlarges your eventual benefit and it enlarges it for life. And it's also really important to think about if you're um, part of a, a, a couple that you're super thoughtful about social security planning, especially on behalf of the younger spouse, because the larger benefit will be the one that will persist with the younger spouse throughout his or her lifetime. So I'm gonna leave it there. I've got um, my email address here. I can't take anyone's personal question. I can't give any financial planning advice to any of you personally, but um, I certainly feel free if you uh, would like a copy of the slides or if I can help um, answer any more general questions, I'm happy to do that. And I think we do, I talked for so long, but I think we do have a few minutes to take some of your questions here as well. Um, so I'm happy to to tackle those. Yeah, uh, thank fantastic. You. Thank you so much, Christine. I really uh, appreciate that. Sorry to cut you off there for a second, Paul. No. Uh, just jumping into some of the questions that we've that we've received. Um, one, I, which I think is a, a important question. So, how do the bucket funds work for smaller retirement funds? So, say three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars, or in that strategy, are there are there other suggestions that you? would um, recommend. And, um, and then following on that, on that, if you use the bucket strategy for withdrawals, won't you have to rebalance after multiple bad equity market years? Um, otherwise, after withdrawals from just bond funds, your asset allocations would be in all equity and thus risky? Yeah, such, such a good set of questions. So I'll tackle the first question about size. So in some of my illustrations, I included some pretty large amounts at the baseline bucket portfolio that I showed you was um, one and a half million dollars. But the nice thing about it is that it's completely scalable. So if your portfolio is $500,000, you would just scale down the position sizes accordingly. You'd keep the proportions the same, but the position sizes would scale accordingly. Um, and I think it's also one reason I like the, the strategy is that it's also very much scalable based on what your portfolio withdrawals are. So say you're lucky enough to be a retired college professor. 
and you're just pulling 2% from your portfolio per year or in the first year of retirement and you plan to do that for another decade, well, accordingly, your investments in safe assets would be really quite low, right? You would have some safer assets because you're spending something from the portfolio. So I like that it's scalable up and down based on what your spending rate is. Um, then I wanted to tackle your second, the second part of your question about the rebalancing, which is super important. That um, when I show these, show the slide of what the bucket portfolio looks like, it seems so intuitive. You just think, well, I just spend through the buckets, but you're absolutely right that um, it would uh, potentially require some rebalancing. But the key thing to note is that it's the it's the bad market environment occurring early in your retirement that's so problematic. For those of you who are later in retirement, where perhaps you have been retired for, um, I think people are requesting the presentation and my email is chiming, sorry about that. Um, it, uh, if you are someone who's later in retirement, you've really made it through the danger zone for sequencing risk. If a bad market environment occurs when you're 85, that's not such a big deal for you. You don't have as as it you don't have as great a need to have safer assets in your portfolio. Um, but some rebalancing on an ongoing basis does does make sense. And I've written extensively about this topic on Morningstar.com. I've also written and you could probably find it by typing in bucket maintenance in the search engine. Um, and I've also written extensively about tax planning with this bucket strategy because it's, you know, most of us are bringing in multiple pools of money into retirement. Um, we might have Roth assets, we might have traditional tax deferred assets, we might have taxable assets. So unfortunately, it's not as simple as one big portfolio. So I've written about that topic as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so a couple questions uh, around the, the, um, the, the market currently. So one, uh, one question, um, I'm 57, portfolio has done well. However, my deep down belief is that there will, will have a sharp and sustained pullback at some time, no clue when. So how do I protect myself? With the massive issues such as debt and Fed will uh, not be effective at some point. Um, I'm currently 80-20 equities. And then another question, um, given the meager outlook over the next decade, understanding that we can't predict the future, where do you recommend we invest uh, if within five years of retirement to optimize prior to, optimize prior to retirement? Yeah, um, it's a good question and I can't give anyone any specific allocation. Um, what I would say though, is that I do like that idea of um, the bulwark that you are building yourself a kind of a safe portion of your portfolio that uh, would serve as a protective device if um, the market is weak over the next couple of years or even longer. Um, that idea of building enough in cash, uh, high quality short and intermediate term bonds um, that you could, uh, fall back on if your equity portfolio were uh, just kind of flatlining or even worse in uh, such a period. My team um, that I work as part of recently completed a research report where we looked at correlations across various asset classes. And the goal was just to show what is the best diversifier. If someone has, assuming that most people have most of their money in equities in, in US equities, what is the category that has historically done the best job of holding its ground or maybe even gaining a little bit of value in those periods? And you might not be surprised to hear that US Treasury bonds tended to do pretty well from that standpoint, um, that they tended to be really effective ballast for equities in, in downturns. Cash actually also looked um, pretty good. Gold looked reasonably okay, um, but treasuries have historically been a really effective kind of buffer uh, 
asset in equity market downturns. So I hope that that answers the question. That's terrific. Well, we're, we're close to the end of time. I wanna uh, give Christine and Paul um, uh, great uh, appreciation for, um, for, for being a part of this. Paul, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? You, you know, I, I so appreciate you doing this, Christine, because uh, I, I think you've opened up some ideas for people that they're gonna follow up on and it'll make a difference. I do have a, a, a curious question about what you believe in terms of saving rates. What should people be saving? And of course, we're most worried about people who are getting started where they have the time to have it to do its work. But what, what are you telling young people? I think 15%, Paul, is a good starting point. Um, certainly higher income earners, I usually like to tell them to try to shoot even higher if they possibly can. But I think 15% is uh, a, a really good starting point. I, unfortunately, that 10% number is very much out there. And I think people think, well, as long as I'm doing 10%, I'm doing okay. It's certainly better than nothing. But I would rather see people reach for 15% if they, if they possibly can. Understanding that a lot of younger people are really multitasking, where they may be saving for a home down payment or to pay for a wedding or whatever it might be. Um, but I, I do think 15% is a good starting point. And one last question. Um, you have 20 model portfolios. We have lots. Lots of our friends have lots. How do you, how do you give somebody unbiased advice as to how to pick the best model portfolio? That's such a good question, Paul. Um, my portfolios are pretty vanilla. So the bucket portfolios are sort of aligned with what I've talked about here. Um, but I think the best portfolio is the one that you believe in that you think you can stick with. We have so much research on investor behavior at Morningstar where we see that investors systematically hurt themselves with these timing decisions where they are um, chasing things that have worked in the past. I'm afraid that's very much going on right now with some of the high octane, high momentum stocks that have been pacing the market. Mm -hmm. And we see that investors buy high and then they sell low and it, you know, it's rinse and repeat. We see it again and again. So I think it's, you know, if you find a portfolio that resonates with you intellectually that you think you can stick with, that's the winner um, based on what you know of your own behavior and, and um, you know, how you've, how you've fared in the past. I think that's probably a way to navigate. And let's make sure we've left our viewers with knowledge of the ways you are helping. You have your weekly podcast, The Long View, you have your weekly column. Uh, is that weekly or do you do that more often? It's a couple times a week. I usually write one new piece a week and um, it's usually a couple times a week. I do a lot of videos for Morningstar.com. In normal times, I love being out and about speaking to live audiences of investors because hearing their questions gives me a sense of what to work on. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank you, Paul, for being on the podcast, too. We've had some wonderful guests, um, and you, you were gracious enough it to was fun. take part in Great it recently. Fun. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. We really appreciate your sharing. Thank you so much. Thanks for including me in this great educational event. And Jim, thank you, by the way, and Jessica, and all the people that worked very hard putting this together, and Kathleen Thorne over at Library U. A whole bunch of you. You made it.